Hi everyone. So let's talk about critical reading. So what do I mean by critical reading? Um, I mean that we're actually engaging the text on a more deep level than just kind of doing a cursory read of, of the information. We're actually not just reading it in order to just simply comprehend it. That means just to basically summarize or state back what the writer had said. But we're doing these other two um, higher order critical thinking um, activities, and that is to kind of understand how did the writer say it? So picking apart the text and analyzing the specific features in it. And then the, the highest level here is having a rhetorical awareness. And that's when you understand why the writer said it in the way that was said. So what is it rhetoric? What does that mean rhetorical awareness? awareness? So rhetoric is just simply the art of persuasion. And just like any other type of art, so a musician or a painter, um, those, those artists have tools and techniques that they use in order to create their art. And the same is true when a writer creates a written text, creates that art. And those tools and techniques, I've listed a few of them here. These are the ones I want us kind of looking at right away here at the beginning of the semester. Um, and But there are more. So modes of development, that's when the writer uses a certain mode, what we call a mode, in order to develop different ideas. And those modes might be using illustration, or that another word for that is using examples, or giving a brief story, narration, description, process analysis, definition. These are all different modes of development. Um, the mode of development can be used as an overarching organizational structure so maybe the entire piece is showing process analysis or perhaps it's just happening in an in individual paragraph so just one paragraph will offer process analysis so modes of development are really important to be looking for as you're reading so when do you see the writers doing these different activities these di using those different modes organizational patterns so um, we have kind of three and a half big organizational patterns so chronological time order reverse chronological spatial order um, that's actually how we engage a physical space it's not used very frequently and then we have logical order. I've only listed just a small bulleted list here. There could be many, many other types of logical orders um, to, to be used in, in, a, in a written text. But the thing that you want to keep in mind is um, the organizational pattern should really be underscoring the purpose of the piece. So if the purpose is to illustrate a lesson learned, then maybe using chronological order makes the most sense so that your, your readers are kind of going through the same kind of discovery lesson that they're, they're, they're learning um, as, as the writer wants them to, to be kind of understanding of that, that lesson. Um, if you want to, to explain some sort of unfamiliar concept, then maybe using an extended analogy makes a lot of sense. So analogy is a, is a comparison. So you take something that somebody already understands, so that would be the analogy part, and you apply it onto something um, that people don't understand. And so an extended exam, extended analogy might make a lot of sense. Um, okay, so we want to kind of think about um, identifying the, the organizational pattern and then kind of be thinking about why did the writer choose that particular organizational pattern. Evidence choices. So just really briefly, we'll take a look at different evidence choices, but I want you kind of paying attention when you're reading. How is the writer supporting the claims? Is the writer using general examples and personal examples and hypotheticals? Those are more kind of considered soft evidence. Or is the writer using what we call more concrete evidence like statistical data, expert testimony, surveys, um, reports? And so kind of be thinking about the evidence that is being used to help support the claims. We want to think about language choices. So with language choices, um, think I want everybody to kind of always have in their, their mind that all language is inherently slanted. So language is always going to be kind of communicating both a fact and then a feeling. So let's say I wanted to tell you guys that I went for a run this morning. Um, and I, I, and if I could show you, I would just show the movement of me running. I didn't want to even use that word run because if I say I went for a run, you would have one kind of emotional feeling about what I did this morning. If I say I went for a jog, you would have a different kind of understanding of that. If I said I was training, you'd have a different kind of understanding of that. So depending on what word is used is going to tell us, um, communicate um, this, this, the, both the fact of the exercise that I was doing, <laughs> along with this, this feeling about my, my intention of that exercise. So um, it's, it's, 
it's really important to be paying attention to slanted language as you're reading. Um, a lot of times this language is really kind of just slips in there. So imagine if you were reading a document that was 2000 words and you were reading about some war and you read source A, it was 2000 words, but sprinkled in those 2000 words, there's language like censorship, propaganda, destroy, kill. And then you read another source about that war and sprinkled in this long 2000 word source with worse language like reporting guidelines, press briefings, suppress. Now it's easy to see right now when I kind of put these, lang put these word choices side by side, you can clearly see that source A is probably pretty much against that war and source B is kind of, um, you know, at least maybe, I don't know, maybe not favorable, favor in favor of the war, but at least seeing that the war is necessary. And so always be paying attention to the language choices. As you see them, um, develop your own type of annotation tool that maybe you put a box around them or a star next to them, or you highlight them a certain color. So you're really paying attention to how language is both communicating the fact and the feeling. Okay, so um, always pay attention to language choices. Tone, uh, as you're reading something, think about how is the writer trying to make you feel as you're reading it? So angry, joyful, elusive, vexed, sarcastic, <laughs> nostalgic. So always be paying attention to how language choices and sentence structures and all these other things that are happening in the text, how it's trying to get us to feel something. Okay, um, sentence constructions. When you're reading, a lot of times maybe we're not paying attention to the sentence um, constructions, but keep in mind that short sentences are gonna be used to kind of highlight a point or imply straightforwardness. Long sentences are gonna be there to add detail, draw things out. Um, these different types of sentence constructions that are being used, we wanna be paying attention to that. We wanna be paying attention to punctuation, so how punctuation is communicating um, kind of uh, elements as well. Um, and lastly, I always want you to be paying attention to repetition. So anytime something is repeated, whether that be a, a particular word, whether or not that be maybe a dash is used again and again, maybe it's a certain sentence structure that's used multiple times, pay attention to that. Skilled writers are always gonna be using a repetition uh, strategically in order to highlight ideas, connect ideas, kind of indicate of importance. So be paying attention to those different um, sentence construction choices. And then finally, rhetorical techniques. So um, there are many different rhetorical techniques. I'm sure everybody's familiar with rhetorical questions or figurative language. Um, I have one document here. I'll share some other ones with you as the semester progresses. But those are really, really um, important tools that the writers use as well to work on their art of persuasion. Okay, so um, as we're reading, um, there's kind of steps I want you guys to go through. So the first step is, is to be ident identify where you see the writer using these different tools. So when you see that a writer's using illustration that is offering examples, make a little note in, in the margin. Or if you see the writer um, using a certain kind of statistical evidence or using general examples, make little notes about that. So we first have to analyze. That's when we're picking all these things apart and we're identifying those things. Then we start doing the rhetorical awareness part. And that's when we start to ask ourselves, well, why did the writer make that choice? What other possible choice could have the writer used? Once we start thinking like that, we start thinking, okay, well, why was this used? Who is the audience? How does that be effective with the audience? What would be the strategy behind that? Um, then we can finally start to kind of understand, um, have, a, have a deeper understanding of the rhetorical awareness. I like to kind of think of it kind of like a little puzzle <laughs> where you're trying to figure out, remember, this is a blank page when, the, when it starts, right? So everything in that document is there um, for a reason. And we're trying to kind of um, kind of pull back the curtain and understand why the writer made the different choices. Then we can finally make some sort of judgment about whether or not those choices were effective. Um, that's kind of our final step. Okay, um, back to our guiding questions then. So I want to talk about what these things actually look like when we're actually writing about the things that we're going to be reading. So when we are doing comprehension, we're going to say the writer says blah, blah, blah. And this is just kind of purely summarizing what the writer has said. So this is kind of the lowest level of the critical reading strategies. It's a really important one because obviously we can't be thinking about these higher order if we didn't have a baseline understanding of what was actually said. So comprehension is really, really important, being able to accurately identify the thesis and accurately identify all the topic sentence ideas or all the main supporting ideas that help develop that. So that's an important skill and that's something else I want you guys to be paying attention to as you're reading. 
The next one is the analysis part. So that's when we're picking out the modes of development. We're thinking about things like evidence, organization, all those other things that I had talked about earlier on in this slide. So when we're doing the analysis, sentences might read something like, the writer uses narration to support her second main point, that blah, blah, blah. And what you're seeing here now is that it's not that the narration just happened there because the writer wanted to tell the story, but that, that the reader understands that narration was in service to supporting some sort of other idea. And that's the really important idea with analysis is that you get why the choices are being made, how they're actually developing the, the piece. So that's the analysis part. One really important thing to think about when you're doing analysis is the actual essay structure itself. So when we're doing academic writing, this is pretty much a, probably something you guys have all seen. If these each represent different paragraphs, you have an introduction and the last line of your introduction is your thesis. Then your first body paragraph starts out with a topic sentence and then there's support for that topic sentence. There's probably a concluding statement here at the end. And we just repeat that pattern and then finally we offer a conclusion paragraph at the end. So that's the academic writing model. But look at all these other models that we have out there. You might have a pair, an essay that has four paragraphs of introduction. You might have a model that the thesis actually comes last. You might have a model where the thesis is kind of somewhere in the middle. So be paying attention to where these really important components happen. Um, in your reading and could be marking up your text for where you see those happening so that we can then understand why the writer would choose to put the put this much introduction or why the writer would choose to wait to do the thesis until the very end. Okay, um, when we're thinking about why did the, the rhetorical awareness, so why did the writer say what was said and the way it was said, we always wanna think about that intended audience. Who is the original intended, intended audience? We wanna be thinking about the rhetorical situation. So with the rhetorical situation, we wanna think about who, you know, where did the article appear? Who is the writer writing to? Um, when did the piece, uh, when was it written? What's the primary frame? So those are all the rhetorical um, situation things. And then the classical appeals of logos, ethos, and pathos. I linked to a document here. Some of you may be familiar with these terms. If not, you can read through that doc document. So a sentence that would indicate rhetorical awareness would be something like, the writer devotes three paragraphs of introduction in order to blah, blah, blah. So you're really kind of understanding why the writer did that. Okay, so the last thing here, we're almost done. Last thing is I want you guys to be annotating your text. Um, that means marking up your text. So I want you to try to identify where's the thesis? Where do you see topic sentence ideas or main supporting ideas to that thesis? Where's evidence for each one of those pieces of support? Look for those classical appeals. Ask questions in the margin. Um, perhaps write a summary statement. I link to a document here where you can take a look at how we would actually write a summary statement. Um, write a summary paragraph. I link to a document here as well. And then take notes as you're reading. Why do you think the writer made these different choices? Um, consider who the intended audience is or was and make inferences about why those choices were made. So that's really, really important to be actively writing and thinking and engaging your text as you're reading it so that we can get to this all of the, well, actually, I, maybe I can't say that. All of these things are really important. We have to be able to accurately understand the text. Then we have to be able to understand how it was construction constructed, and then we finally have that rhetorical awareness. Um, so we, we kind of pull back the curtain and we understand why the writer made these different choices. Okay, so that is what I wanted to talk about with critical reading. I hope you guys found this PowerPoint um, and this video helpful. Um, email me if you have any questions. Okay, we'll talk soon.